to another Head to Head, and it's good morning to Keith Sutherland. Good morning, Dennis English. As we head towards uh, Christmas, Keith, uh, we, we're looking at things at Bendigo, I guess we've got people talking about around coffee shops and, uh, you know, the coffee tables this week. Uh, there's a few things, and today I noticed the council having a press conference on the, uh, the outcome of the mosque appeal. Do you know what the outcome is yet? I've not heard. No, I don't know, and I think that, um, yeah, also got that press release this morning. Be there at half past 12 today, hear all about it, but my guess is that the um, um, Beat Cat and the um, appeal and everything else, it's, they've all done everything proper, so I would expect it just to rubber stamp and go ahead and they can go start building the mosque, I would think. Will it be the end of it, though, like with uh, the anti-mosque brigade? Is it likely to be the end of it? Because we've had Julie Hoskin in here before saying that, look, we won't ever give up. If this we exhaust this avenue, we'll take it a step further. I don't think it'll be the end of it. I think that there'll be um, the right-wing element and um, re um, rednecks will be out there sort of protesting when they sort of pour the first lab, I would expect. And so then we're going to have to employ the police, um, keeping the peace all the way through the process, which is very sad when all things, all channels have been complied with, everything is done properly, council's done it right. Um, I think, you know, they should just allow it to happen because the processes have all been done, all the appeals have been heard. So that's my guess, but I don't think it'll be a plain sailing at all. Well, we'll watch that one with interest. What else has got uh, your pot boiling this week? Well, I think the hot weather, Dennis. I hate the hot weather. And then I love the we've got weather. the... My info yesterday was um, rather interesting. And as you and I have discussed many, many times over, Dennis, I think on a federal level, I've been saying what a terrible job Joe Hockey did as treasurer. And then, of course, he's been rewarded. Off to um, USA as the ambassador, maybe double dipping on wages. But, um, yeah, to see those um, figures blow out by what they have is just an indictment because pre-election in um, 2013, they suggested that there'll be 4.7 budget deficit in the first year. They would get it in surplus, as Joe Hockey said. We'll have it back in surplus in the first um, year of our 2016-17, um, and we'll have a $4 billion surplus. But we What's have this happened? conversation all the time, though, Keith, and we go around in circles because I will argue every time... You, you'll argue that Labor that blew Labor it out, but mess. actually Labor did not blow it out. Joe Hockey has blown the budget enormously, and it's still blowing out. We've got the figures now, $37.4 billion, and another $26 billion over the next but, four but years Keith, of forward you're, estimates. You're a businessman. You've spent a long time. you built a very successful business. And I, I know that I worked for a, a big company at one stage. And you could argue on the evidence available that uh, poor, a level of poor management at the time led to a situation where most of my friends, a lot of people, lost their jobs. The company, the management all went in the end to it. So are you suggesting bad. poor management somewhere here? I absolutely am because... Well, uh, you you always happens. forget about the global financial crisis we had. A new management team came in. Now, it took that management team, this is my whole point, a good six to ten years to turn that, camp, that ship around from hitting the rocks and being pretty much almost unsalvageable, and a lot of people thought it was, to a point where the company was worth over a billion dollars again. Now, I'm, I'm drawing that parallel with government, and I'm suggesting to you that it's ridiculous and quite childish to say that, all right, you have an administration and immediately they walk out the door, you've got a clean slate. You don't. You've got to clean up the mess they've left. Okay, let's talk about this and clean up the mess. What does um, Tony Abbott do when it comes in? We have, we've talked about the East Wing Link um, fundraising and, and who was right and who was that. wrong. I think and, that's one thing we agree on, though, $1.5 billion was given to the state government in Victoria, the Napthine government, prior wrong, to them even wrong, wanting wrong. to have that money. So what do they do? Tony Abbott blames the previous administration. $1.5 billion and, that wasn't needed, wasn't asked for, but they tried to back up and then blame Labor. So and here's the area that we agree on, though. Uh, well, well, that's good. When, when you say blame Labor, Danny Andrews needs a good swift kick. And so does Dennis Napthine because... Said, there'll be no, we won't pay any Yes, penalties. and the um, Victoria um, Auditor General said he should not have said that. I've said... But, He's also the, um, accused the Napthine government of huge hypocrisy by saying this is a great thing. It was and going I, to be 45 cents in the dollar benefit to Victorians. So we have wasted an enormous amount of money. Tony Abbott has been really, he should be charged with pork barrelling, the biggest amount ever to be pork barrel in this Keith, country. I think that's where we agree. That I, okay, well, my well argument let's was, move on then. Back well, to that's the right. my I, FO I think then. We'll move on before I do that, just to make that point that we do agree. We agree that I think Liberal... The Liberal coalition was wrong 
totally to do wrong. what they did and sign contracts. And they can argue any way they like. It was wrong to do what they did in, in the run-up to an election to commit Victoria to that sort of expenditure. Um, on the other hand, Andrews was totally wrong too to go to an election and say that we won't pay one dollar or whatever he yes, said. Yes, he got that wrong. And I, I agree with you on that point. Yep, he my got whole that wrong. point is that this is the problem, and I think we could go around in circles all day, but. I prefer to look at, all right, what do we do? Because whilst we're, we're talking about what's gone wrong and blaming and where the blame lies, that tends to be what the national press is doing as well at the moment. And I'd see a lot more value for, for our generations, you've got kids as I do, to, uh, to look at what can be done to salvage right. this situation. Let, let's go back to the MyFO yesterday, 34 point, um, or $37.4 billion budget um, deficit coming up. Now, Look at it, and what are they doing? What did um, Scott Morrison do yesterday? Hit health and hit aged care. Nothing about multinationals who are not paying their fair share of tax in this country. There's some legal loopholes that they are taking advantage of, not paying tax in this country. We've got superannuation, and I'm part of it. I get the benefit of that, not even being looked at. But what do they do? They hit the people that can least afford it in the hip pocket the and aged care. But so why only look at one side of the equation? Why not look on the other side agree with again, multinationals? Pete, and we, we're not meant to and agree on much here. We usually don't. We take shouldn't it. be agreeing, Dennis. <laughs> But I do agree on that because in the same way that I, this is where I'm coming from, I'm saying that across the board with politics, that is the problem. We're not talking Liberal and Labor, we're talking Carlton and Collingwood. So no matter what, the supporters of each are blind, as I'm talking about the voters, are blind to the faults of their own side and it's, it's at all costs win the game, end of story. Now the problem with that is that you've got Liberal and Labor, both Prime Ministers, both leaders, potential Prime Ministers. Going to any election, and this is going to go on and on and on ad nauseum. That's right. There'll never be agreement votes, on anything. To win votes. And that's all about the punters out there, the average voter. Or what can we give them or what can we promise them that's going to make them vote for us so we can get into power? And it's just an ugly, vicious circle. It's driving me crazy. Um, which leads me into the next thing because I don't know if you saw the Scott Morrison interview last night with Lee Sales. I didn't, no. Um, very it interesting. would have been good, though, And he Lee said Sales. that basically, oh, Lee, you're trying to bring in politics well. Blow me down if it hasn't been politics for the last five years exactly. about what's happening. And where it also comes into play is um, look at the huge about face coming out of the Paris um, climate change conference that they've had. Now, Tony Abbott said no more wind farms. We're not pr providing any more money into that area. Um, research now, Malcolm Turnbull's seen the light and, of course, he's using the outcome of the Paris um, climate change talks to say, all right, we're going to go in that direction. We will fund wind farm research because they all re realise that renewables are the way to go because fossil fuels have to be uh, phased out. And when we're talking $48 billion that we provide to as subsidies to mining companies and farmers on fossil fuels and coal. It is so, so wrong. But we own my point about Scott Morrison, why hit one side of politics? Why not look at the other side? And, but I think too, Keith, it's all very well. And I'd love, look, I'd love nothing more than to have somebody convince me that we could go flick, and even if it was a, a transition phase over a few years, to say that wind power or, or solar power can solve all our problems. Well, it can't immediately. Coal. It can't, that's right. So we've got to and we've got a put money into the research. But of you've it. got a situation in South Australia, right, that wind farms are an enormous thing over there, and it's fantastic. They've done a great job. The fact is, though, as I understand it, when, they, when the wind don't blow, the, the uh, power doesn't happen either. And but we've got they solar. Do? They pull we've got back in, up no, with solar. No, they pull straight into Victoria and pull it out of the grid here from coal-powered uh, st power stations. We can't, and I, I, cr I grant you that. We cannot mm. just phase out the coal power yep. um, because it's got to be the, um, for the future. 70% of our generation mm. is coal. So yep. it's silly to even think Absolutely. it won't um, be God, part of our future. we're a lot today, Keith. I'm really worried now. <laughs> I don't know whether I'm coming your way or vice versa. <laughs> well, I don't know if I'm going your way. I don't think that could <laughs> be the case. Let's hope we're meeting in the middle somewhere. <laughs> I do have an invitation for you, though, Keith. What's that invitation, Dennis? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know whether there already is one, but I'm inviting you to join the Save Australia Party because I reckon it's time we had a party that went to hell, to hell with this left-right uh, dogma and said, right, it's time to get serious. We are facing, uh, uh, future generations are uh, facing a really bleak future with the levels of debt that current generations are running up. And I'll, if I can, I'll just indulge myself. I know Please, I don't normally you, you do can that. be the leader of the party and I'll see where you go with this. <laughs> I'll just run through a couple of things. I'll tell you what I would do tomorrow as the Save Australia Party. I'd hit negative gearing on their head straight away because it's, it's inflating house prices and it's giving generous tax concessions to people who've already got enough money to throw it. At, and now uh, that I'm out of real estate, properties. I probably agree with you. Yes. Right. 
I'd cut the public service, I reckon, by 25%. And I've seen great managers, managers in private enterprise who would walk into that public service setup that we've got now. I, I understand from the figures I've seen, spending on public servants in Victoria alone, this is Victoria, has increased by over half a billion dollars, over $500 million in the time that Andrew's government's been in power. That, that's just ridiculous. Can I just pull you up on that point? Yeah. Every time this happens, every government comes in and you look at the Kennett government, slash and burn the public service, you look mm. at what happened with Tony Abbott, slash and burn, we put it out to private tender to do the same I'm, job I'm and it that. comes, it's more expensive. So yeah. don't well, tell me that, I, and it gets rid of jobs in the process. Well, I'd, I'd stick with that though. I'd still cut the public service by 25%. I'd slash government costs further though by cutting out state governments, get rid of them. Totally I'd agree have on that one. Federal government, and I'd have the local government. Where no you've got argument with me at all. Okay, so they'd be gone. Enormous savings right across the, the nation. And not there. duplication, and no arguments about demarcation disputes as which one is responsible. Absolutely. The other thing I do, and it's funny you've led to that yourself with the last comment you made. The other thing I do is I would immediately have a, a very good look at the costs to the community of those sectors, the feel-good enterprises, I would call them, that used to be government departments and now handed out to the private sector. Now, they can be employment agencies and all those sorts of things, and you know, good luck to some of the people. I could name a couple um, <laughs> that, that have done very, very we well know out of this. one lady that's uh, made a lot of money out a of it. A lot of money. And been it. very good at it too, very it, successful, not just here in England and beyond. Exactly, you know, whether it's CFA, WorkSafe, DSE, wherever you look, these, and they're doing something worthwhile, yes, but they're costing an arm and a leg, and they've got their hand up for more, more, more all the time. And the problem is, whilst they make a contribution to the quality of our lives, at the same time, the cost that the community is bearing to run those services is a cost that doesn't contribute anything in terms of dollar output to it. They don't create a product. But you're still going to have a back end um, administration somewhere. It's all very well. Oh, you would. I'm talking about efficiencies. And do it, yeah. I'm talking about efficiencies to cut. Um, the other thing I would do is I'd end the age of entitlement for politicians straight away. <laughs> and we've seen it with We both agree with that one. Rudd, Gillard, Hockey, um, it, the list goes on. It's just well, I, I don't think you can say that about Rudd, Gillard. They're politicians that the system is um, involved. They didn't get um, appointments overseas. Joe Hockey's appointment is a political one. You can say that all the other ones that have been done in between have been political ones. But yeah, I don't think you can mention Rudd and um, Gillard. I'm in talking that because about the, the generous the super that they get. No matter what job they do, what shape they leave the place in, they still ride off into the sunset, write a book or give some speeches and get paid a lot of money for it. As with Tony Abbott is doing. With the, yeah, Whilst with, he's still in Parliament, by the way. With a generous uh, superannuation pay. Yeah. The other one is, uh, and you probably hate this one, I, this is the one <laughs> would probably be more likely. How ridiculous is that? I acknowledge up front the Save Australia Party would be probably in a real lot of trouble if it introduced a coffee tax. So I'm talking about a dollar a cup. <laughs> Look, do it for two or three years, you'd nearly knock the damned deficit on the head in three years. A dollar a cup and bring it back to 50 cents a cup when uh, well, we I'm a get coffee back drinker, the but um, if it's going to go to the deficit and it's not going to go to the pollies and the, um, on the process, OK. Only two more points, Keith. One is I would straight away shake up the school curriculum and I would introduce into school so that kids learn from the very earliest age the value of a dollar and the concept of cash flows that's so important to a small business. So they understand you can apply those principles that are applicable to a small business or any business. You've been doing your homework here, Dennis. Well, to government. I, I suppose I'm just thinking out loud, but <laughs> to government so that people, those kids become voters one day. And instead of thinking, I put my hand out and I vote because somebody puts something or says they're going to put that in my hand, to understand that before it comes in... I agree with that Exactly. One. Or before it goes out, it's got to come in. And there's not that understanding. And the last one is national service for every kid, all right? It might mean they have to skip schoolies in Bali or on the Gold Coast and send them to boot camp instead. But give every kid in Australia an absolute clear understanding of the sacrifices that have been made for the quality of life and the democracy we have uh, as part of their curriculum and their, their learning at school. And take that with them on life's journey and no exceptions. I don't want to hear anybody from another culture saying, sorry, not available for national service because we don't hold it. All right, see you, see you later, free air travel back to wherever. I, I, I don't have a problem with that one because it works very well in Turkey. But um, the only difference is in Turkey that they do go into to fight. I don't expect that these kids that have only been trained um, go into fight. Yeah, I think you've yeah. got your trained um, armed forces to do that. But it gives them a discipline which I think would, is sadly lacking um, in our community. So, yes, I agree with a few of those points. Gee, I'm so, shocked. Um, well, you've a, done your homework last night. So, Dennis, I, I think on that note we probably should call it quits because <laughs> we're almost the agreeing. The last one, though, Keith, uh, and it's not to do with the Save Australia Party, but... 
Um, I know you were vocal and a lot of a lot of comment on social media too in relation to uh, McFarlane's failed attempt to get back into the ministry by uh, swapping parties. I mean, <laughs> what a mess. Um, and I've got that very question to ask. Um, Senator McKenzie is coming in next mm. and we will discuss that. Actually, and that will yeah. be because uh, if anyone, uh, two people, particularly I would say Barnaby Joyce and Warren Truss have got egg on their face, those two guys have, mm. for orchestrating this, goes across, the party knocked him back 12, 14 to 12, that they don't want him, They, for the sake of unity and um, the party co coalition together, but he gets out now. He's in the wilderness. The Liberal Party don't want him. The NAS probably will welcome would, him. Would but Labor have a look at him though, with uh, oh. Shorten down in the polls? Would they have a look at McFarlane? Or <laughs> I not? don't think so. They're, nev they're never <laughs> going to win that seat, Dennis, because it's either a strong national um, yeah. stronghold or Liberal strong. So the Labor Party only, haven't got a hope joking. in hell yeah. of um, winning that one. But what a mess! You're mm. right. And the poor guy now he's going to be lost. And he's saying, well. I've had 10 years as a minister doing this, I'll probably go into private enterprises. Mm. And why wouldn't you snap him up? Because yeah, he's got a lot of expertise. Context. Yeah. Yep. No, you uh, showed probably a, a, a lack of good political uh, or sound political judgment. You'd wonder as a minister how you've got by for 10 years if you can make a critical decision like he yeah. has in this. But instance. I think he was conned into it by Barnaby. That's my opinion. Mm. And I'm Barnaby sure that would Senator. Never do that. Oh, of course he would, Dennis. No. He's part of your, <laughs> your party. And um, of course uh, he would. So it'll be interesting to see what um, slant um, Senator McKenzie has on that mm. because I'm sure she won't be as. Um, um, aggressive as perhaps you and I are mm. towards it though. We'll wait and see. All right, Keith. It's uh, been great again, Keith, to enjoy a, a spirited discussion, <laughs> shall I say. But not only that, but uh, enjoyable right through the whole 12 months to enjoy these discussions with you. And I'm so, sorry, when do, where do I sign up for this um, party? Because it's not too bad. You've probably got some really good valid points there. There though. might be a booth <laughs> down in Hargraves Mill sometime <laughs> okay. early in the new year. But uh, seriously, Keith, thanks so much for taking the time out. You do it off your own bat and really appreciate it. Uh, Thank you, Dennis. I think if only more people took an active interest in what's happening in Australia and in politics generally, We'd, uh, we'd be a lot better off, so thank you. And it's good that we have a bit of fun and we yeah. have a few arguments along the way, but today was a bit disappointing. We did agree on a few things, but <laughs> also to you, Dennis, and um, we wish you all the best for Christmas and look forward to getting back into it with whole new um, items to t discuss early in the new year. Local government and federal elections next year, so it'll be a big one. So thank you uh, again for t joining us today and we'll look forward to catching up with you in the new year as well. <laughs> <laughs>